Welcome to Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina. I do things every day to try to feed my spirit or nurture me. These are some things I've been doing this week, and I think I might let you just join with me if you just stand and bow your head a moment before we begin our session this evening. Uh, there are things that I try to affirm every day. Uh, you might call it confessions. I just call it affirmations. I affirm some things I believe and some things I believe about God. So just close your eyes a moment and relax. Think about where all you've been today and what all you've been exposed to and just ask the Holy Spirit, if you would, to clear your mind, clear your spirit, and clear your body of all the lint that we pick up out in the world. There are seven of these that I've been doing this week, so please join with me. Would you just say, uh, by the power of Christ in me, I am directed. I am directed and protected. And protected. I am lifted up. I am lifted up by the power of God. By the power of God within me. Within me. I am open. I am open to the peace of God. To the peace of God within. Within. I am whole. I am whole and healthy. And healthy in mind. In mind. Body. Body and, spirit. and spirit. God's healing power, God's healing power is, at work is at work in me tonight. In me tonight. I, am being healed I am being healed and renewed. And renewed. Divine, life Divine life is renewing, is renewing every, cell every cell in my body. In my body. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let that soak in a moment as you stand in the presence of the Lord. I think we might be prepared spiritually now. Our youth are meeting this evening. My wife. My family's ministering to children and teenagers in the back. All kind of things happen back there. So, but I'm glad we're out here. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, we've been around a long time now. This is 46 or 47 years, ever how long 69 is. 1969 seems like a long time ago. and it Really, it must have been, wasn't it? <laughs> but uh, some of the meanest people... I've ever met in my life have been at the church house. Amen. Look back over your past and think about that. I worked with Marcelo for about 17, 18 years, did a lot of traveling, and I met a lot of ministers in the cities, and I was behind the scenes and a lot of things, and I just saw a lot of things I didn't like. Uh, three weeks. I was in Kenya, in Africa, and there was a message that I preached almost everywhere we went in Kenya and around Kenya. We, we traveled 300 miles outside of Nairobi to the bush country and so forth. But there was a message God gave me over there, and I never did feel like maybe the Western world need to hear it. But it comes out of the little book of Amos, so don't turn there, just let me quote it to you. But in the Old Covenant, God spoke through the prophet Amos, and he said these words, prepare to meet your God. Man. Sometimes I do funerals. I did one this past week uh, in the privacy of a home, small family gathering. Did you really don't know the person you're conducting a service on behalf of 
But through the years, I've met some great people, some good people, some saintly people. It's such an honor to do the funerals for those people. I know a lot. The Lord asked me that the early part of the week. I know a lot. I should, at my age, three seminaries, studied all my life. I'm, a, I'm an avid reader. I have books and books and books. I'll go through a book in a few days. I just love to read. But I'm going to tell you what the Lord asked me, and I haven't gotten over it yet, so you're going to hear more about it tonight, because when he talks to me, I try to talk to you. Amen. He asked me, he said, uh, you know a lot? I said, yes, sir. You're trying to figure out where this is going. He said, all this knowledge you have, has it made you more Christ-like? My favorite word. You know what it is, don't you? Ira. 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 So let me ask you tonight, those of you who've walked with the Lord for a long time, how has it helped you? We've talked about truth here, man. That's a biggie for me. Knowing the truth, truth you know sets you free. All this truth you have acquired, how has it helped you become more like Jesus? My wife and I had an argument this morning. I shouldn't say anything because her favorite son's here. <laughs> but I, I, I yelled at her. I hadn't had but one cup of coffee. <laughs> and I raised my voice and I said something. I didn't curse or anything. I said, get off the phone and help me. You come that... The Lord said, hello. <laughs> I thought we'd already had this talk. <laughs> Where's this being like Christ at? I said, I don't care and don't know right now. I've got to deal with this. So I'm dealing with I had a garden hose kinked up. And I was trying to get it straightened out. But anyway, how's it helped you? I know you never do have any of those problems like that. But uh, occasionally I do. This is the first time, so I had to deal with it. But... Uh, some of you will have some of those encounters. You'll maybe lose your temper. You'll say something you shouldn't say. But when that stuff happens, I don't know about you. I don't need a sermon. Nobody has to tell me, hey, man, you just put your foot in your mouth, your bucket mouth. Why didn't you just say that? I know in here. I know in here when I have said something that's been offensive to the Holy Spirit. How about you? And that gummit, it doesn't feel good. And I've been working on the rest of the day trying to get over it. So I went to this place in Cherryville, a little lady up there who, who ministers to feet of senior citizens. And man, she's great. But see, the first thing she asked me when I get in position, she said, okay, tell me what your sermon was Sunday. Here we go. I'm not real spiritual that time. So I started preaching to her what I preached to you folks Sunday. We got through. She does my wife. And, you know, she charges, she shouldn't earn $20 for an hour. I think that's pretty good. That's $10 a foot. And my wife, that's 40 We always give her 50 for a little tip there. She said, I tell you what. She said, you don't owe me anything today. She said, I got my money's worth out of this sermon. I said, oh, I'll be back next month. <laughs> So when I really didn't think I was all that spiritual, she was blessed by some things uh, that I said to her. So uh, some, of the, some of the best people you'll ever meet, some of the greatest people you'll ever meet, will be at the house of God. And occasionally, occasionally, you'll meet someone that's just as mean as the devil. And then you have to go home and talk to the Lord about yourself because they put an attitude in you. And uh, then you've got to talk to the Lord about them. But uh, when God says prepare to meet your God, I looked up the word prepare many years ago, and it actually means be readied. Be readied or be certain. I used to have a favorite question I'd ask a person. Do you know for sure? 
that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven? That's a good question. Do you know for sure? Do you have the assurance that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven? We think about us faith people. We live by faith. And I think about what if we really used our faith for? You know, we use our faith for finances. We use our faith for our health. We use our faith for all kind of reasons. We believe God for this. We believe God for that. We believe God for almost everything. And we're so thankful because he gives us this faith. But the bottom line is, have you used that faith to prepare you to meet God? I'm 73 years old. My buddies are, that I ran with are gone. All of them. You get this age, you start thinking more about eternity. So the faith you have that God gave you, how has that faith, have you used it in preparation to meet God? Someday someone's going to call your name. And someone's going to say, Vernon, the master has come and he's calling for you. And I love that verse of scripture. I'll use it at your funeral probably. It's in the last book of the Bible. It's in the last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22. It says this. And they shall see his face. He's white here. I preached in a black church across town over here. He was black. Their Jesus was black. I, speak, I, I spoke in a lot of Hispanic churches in California. He's tan looking. We don't know what color Jesus is. But I'll tell you one day you will. One day you and I will see Jesus face to face. And you'll know then what he looks like. I... At times, I look forward to that encounter, and at times, I shun from that encounter. Are you with me? It's appointed unto man once to die, and that's no deal, that's no big deal, but after that, the judgment. And that's the downside, can you say amen? Three weeks in Kenya, and I thought this is the message they, that at least the people that I was exposed to needed to hear, Prepare to meet your God. That's Amos 4.12. So, what you know is important. But what you are is more important. I met people in Kenya who uh, didn't know a lot. They lived 300 miles out of Nairobi. They didn't even know there's a place called Nairobi out there. They lived in the bush country. And I went, I was going to teach them all about faith. And I could teach about faith. But see, they didn't need to be taught about faith. They knew faith. They lived by faith. And there's a lot of difference between teaching about faith and living by faith. They lived by faith. That's all they had out there. No physicians. No dentists. Just believed God. Can you say amen? amen. So... You know, it's, sometimes it's not what you know is so important, but it's all about what you are. Are you prepared to meet God? If I did your funeral Sunday, would I have to lie? 1 John 4, 17, let's get on it real quick. This is the word from the NIV. Let me read it to you, please. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence in the day of judgment because in this world, we're like him. In this world, we are like him. I like this translation. In this world, we are like him. Can I get a witness? So I don't think there's anything more important in your life and in my life than being like Christ. Just, just nod your head. 
I believe there's a reason for this new creation. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll read that verse or quote that verse to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There's a reason for this new creation. And the big reason, of course, is to prepare us to meet God. But there's something else that happens when we are recreated by the power of God. There's something restored back into us that was lost when Adam sinned and is called the image of God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. The King James would use the word new creature. When I think about creatures, I think about boogers and snakes and those kind of things. But when I think about creation, I can handle creation. I can understand creation. So the Bible says, and the literal Greek is creation. So therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Say creation, please. So why do we have to be recreated? Why can't God just leave us alone? Why do we have to be recreated? Why did God want to make us over when Jesus was resurrected from the dead? Late last night, I was meditating with the Lord, and the Lord says, you know, I said, why did you do this, Lord? He says, I just didn't want to leave you like you were. I said, well, that's good enough for me. (laughs) He just did not want to leave us like we were. He wanted to remake us. He wanted to recreate us. When Jesus was trying to explain this to Nicodemus, he used the word new birth, being born again. Born from above. The word again is simply from above. Having something from heaven coming here and doing something in here. Being born a, again. Nicodemus, of course, didn't understand that. Most of us won't either. But how can you be reborn? You have to be remade. And I've always said that when I became a Christian, my wife got a new man, a new husband. God recreated me. Now, did that mean that I became a saint? No, I'm still working on sainthood. But the thing about it is... I was remade, I was reborn, I was recreated. So the purpose of this, the word new seems, it means to change into another form. To change into another form. Romans chapter 12 is a verse I think that might help us understand it a little bit better. There's a There's a mystery in this, of course we know that, but why do we have to be recreated? Why didn't God just leave us alone, live under the law, try to obey the commandments, offer our sacrifices, and pay the priest and just keep things moving along? When Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, he was the firstborn among many brethren. He was the first one. But see, when he was reborn from the dead, that opened up the way for you and me to be reborn, recreated. So I've always said he began a whole new creation. A group of people that never existed before. Never. Because in the Old Covenant, no one was born again. No one was born again until Jesus Christ was resurrected from the grave. Because if you're going to be saved, you have to believe a few things. And one of them, you have to believe that God raised him from the dead. That's priority. That's a part of being saved. Believing that can help you to become a Christian. You have to believe that. But see, there was something else happened when he came forth. He brought forth other people with him. He changed these people. The Bible calls it a new birth, and Paul calls it a new creation. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says this, Do not conform any longer 
to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transformed is the same word as new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The word new creation, the word transform, they're the same words here in the Greek text. So what we're saying is, we're being, we have been transformed and we are being transformed. But just because you are a new creation doesn't mean that your head is a new creation. You've got to work on that a little bit. And that's the part the Bible calls it renewing of your mind. And that's not something that's real easy to do. There's a great mystery in this new creation. I find that in the book of Colossians chapter 1. We'll go there, please. I'd like to read a couple of verses to you. Verses 26 and 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and verse 27. The mystery, say mystery. mystery. Now remember, the word mystery and the word secret are the same words in the Greek text. Mystery and secret. So we're talking about a secret here. We're talking about a mystery here. The, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed or revealed to the saints, to them God has chosen to make known, make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. For a person with Christ in them, the potential to be Christ-like is there. Yes. Now, how that happens is you'll have to walk it out. Christ in you, the hope of glory. This is a secret of the ages, the Bible says. And the secret is God is now living in your body and in my body. We are becoming like him. We are being restored back into the image. We're acting now out of his nature, which is to love and to live and not to judge. Say not to judge. Not to, judge. to treat people the way he did. And the first thing I did this morning when my wife and I were in strife, see this stuff doesn't last long. I said, Barb, don't worry about me, bless God, worry about yourself. I said, you need to become Christ-like. <laughs> she said, we? I said, no, forget we. I said, you need to become Christ-like because I'd like to see Christ in you. Because if I could see Christ in you, I wouldn't treat you the way I treat you sometimes. She started playing. I'm glad she's in the back. She's not out here to defend herself. But see, you, we think sometimes, you know, hey, the day's going to come when your wife and your husband, your children won't be with you. You won't know where they are. And some angel is going to take you by the hand and going to take you into the presence of Jesus Christ. And you're going to see his face. You're not there to give an account of your wife, yourself. Jesus is going to talk to you about you. And that's why I told my wife, you need to become like Christ. You need to be prepared to meet God. And you know, she's been doing that all day. She's been praying about that all day. She'll be a better mate. I don't see any halos around anybody's head in here, so, you know, we all might need a little work in this area to become more like Christ. I heard a lady named Oprah Winfrey say this, and she gave three words about this Christ-like life. She used the word resemble first, resemble. We need to resemble Christ. She used the second word, reflect. We need to reflect Christ. And the final word was reveal. 
Man, I wrote those three words down. First one, we need to resemble Christ. Well, Christ is in us. The nature of God is in us. We've been recreated to be like him, so why not let it flow? The word resemble, the word reflect, the word reveal. She said, that's your destiny. That's pretty good preaching right there. That's our destiny. We are destined to, uh, let me read that to you in Romans chapter 8. That's our destiny, to become like Christ. Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 29. Verse 29 says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son. Wow, there it is. To be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The firstborn. Jesus was the firstborn. We're the many brothers. He was the firstborn. We've been recreated after him. But the Bible said we are to be conformed to the likeness of his, of his son. Predestined. Decided. It's destined. That's your destiny to become like Jesus. So you just think about what all you've experienced at church. Different people you've met through the years. Even job, on your job site, you meet people. Well, I'm a Christian. All talk and no action. <clears throat> all talk and no action. I'm talking about politicians, all talk and no action. Sometimes we think God's all talk and no action. Sometimes we think other believers are all talking, no action. I'm the kind of fellow at my age, what you say doesn't affect me all that much. What I see does. I want to see Christ in you. I want to see you acting like your daddy. I want to see you acting like your elder brother. I want to see something that will resemble the person of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. So... We, we, we're learning how to do this. Say we're learning how to do this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is a, will help us a little bit understand this, this Christian life as a, as a process. See, I think it should change immediately. And you'll see people who are changed immediately. I was changed so rapidly, it, it, it put fear in me. I didn't know how to deal with this new person. There was a new man moved in. I didn't know how to deal with him. The desires I used to have were gone. Dear God, I wanted to go to church. Who's ever heard of such stuff? I never had that desire before. I wanted to go buy a Bible. I didn't own a Bible. I'm 25 years old. I wanted to go buy a Bible. I said, Barb, I want to go get me a Bible. Amen. I never wanted one before. I'll tell you something else I did. I went to the stag shop in Gaffney. You remember the stag shops? Got it? On the corner there at Harold's Cafe. Real swanky place. Big boys went in there. I went in there and bought me a suit. I never owned a suit in my life. Never wanted one. But listen, something happened when this new man moved into me. I had to learn how to live with this new guy. I couldn't wait to get home to my wife and family where a few days ago I couldn't wait to get with the boys and get in a good card game. My desires have changed. There's a new man that's moved inside of me. Are you listening? And man, it was so sudden. It was so fascinating. And everything looked different. Everything looked new. And my wife knew there was a new kid on the block. Because she saw such changes in me. Are you okay? Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 will help us to understand why it didn't happen for all of us as quickly as we thought it would happen. Verse 18 said, And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being, here's this word is, transformed. We're being transformed 
transform or we're being changed into his likeness. See that? Into his likeness. So when I ask you, are you Christ-like? My question to you, are you being changed into Christ's likeness? Now, can you say amen? amen? Let me end this verse. With ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So this Christian life is a process. Let me end with a couple of thoughts here. What is it I'm being changed back into? What, 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 what is God trying to transform in me? When Adam was created, the Bible said he was created in the image and the likeness of God. We don't know what all that entails. But when you get to the fifth chapter, Adam now is having children, he and Eve. And the Bible said that they, the children, were born in Adam's image. What happened to God's image? Now, I don't go as far as, as some of the Reformation boys do. I don't believe that the image of God was totally eliminated. I just believe it was marred. It's like trying to see through a glass darkly. You can't see. So there's something happened to this image that I carried and I can't explain what happened. Adam knew something happened. But the whole purpose of the new creation is to restore that image back in you. Whatever it was that Adam lost or was marred, it's coming back. It has to come back inside of us. This is the purpose of the new creation. You and I are being restored so we can become like Jesus. The likeness of his son. You, all of it is in preparation for you to meet God. This is a part of preparation. We're being prepared to meet God. Forget about all this stuff we do day by day here. When do you ever think about eternity? Do you have to wait till you get 73 to start thinking about, dear God, I could check out tonight. Or you ready to meet God? The prophet of the old covenant says, prepare. Prepare to meet your God. They shall see his face we read in the New Covenant. So there's a day coming when we will meet him, but we need to be like him while we're in the earth, John said. There's something about you that should resemble Jesus Christ to the people you work with. You should treat them differently. You should love them like Jesus loves them. Don't judge them. He didn't. The people he loved to be around were the old, rotten, stinking sinners. We called them winos. He called them wine bibbers. They called him a wine bibber. You got to hang around a crowd like that if you're going to be called one of them. You might have nipped a little bit himself. I don't know. But the thing about it is, he was no frowning saint. But this is what I want to say to you. There's something about you and me that God is wanting to transform. And I believe it's happening day by day, day by day, week by week, week by week. We are being changed. It's been predestined. You might as well get in line. So we can be conformed back into the image. Say the image. Amen. Image. Colossians 3.10. i got two verses and I'm finished. Colossians 3.10. I've got to read this one to you. And having put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. New self. That's that new man I'm talking about that, that came in me when I was born again. That I had to learn how to adjust to. I had to learn how to live with. Who is this fella? Who, who's, he's trying to control my life. He's trying to head me in another direction now different than I've been going on for 25 years. You've got to understand, when you're 25 years old, you pretty well formed your life. You're making your own decisions. You're your own man. 
Nobody tells you what to do. And all at once, somebody from headquarters has changed inside of me. Vernon's not here all the time. There's somebody else that's moved in. You said, don't do that, do this. Love that person. Don't judge that person. Accept this person. You've got to learn to deal with that. You're being changed. And sometimes down here, you know what you ought to do, but up here's the problem. Our mind has not been transformed yet. So our mind is continually being transformed. This verse, having put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. There's that image. You see how it's come back to us? We're back, listen, we're back just exactly like Adam was before he ever listened to the devil and sin. Innocent. Isn't it wonderful that God could take us back? That's why he's wanting to recreate us. He's wanting to take us back. One more verse. That's in Ephesians chapter 4, please. So let me ask you, how's all this stuff changed you? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Ready? Put on the new man, or the new self, created to be like God. That's pretty simple right there, and that translates isn't it. Lead, to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now let me ask you, are you... Are you more like God today than you were last year? Are you preparing to meet God? Are you using your faith to prepare you for heaven? You know that's where you came from. You came from God. You came here and came into a body. And you're going back to God. If you've passed the test, if you've learned the lessons that you're supposed to learn. And see, today, I had to go around that mountain again. I haven't been around it a few times. I had to go around again today. Well, how long are you going to go? I'll go around it until I pass this test. You don't fail the test God gives you. You just have to take it over. <laughs> so I just, you know, I'll chalk one up. Start a fresh and a new tomorrow. So all these sermons you're listening to, how's it changing you? If it's not making you more like Christ, either I'm failing the Holy Spirit's failing. Something is happening. It's just like if you go to the assembly line and watch the BMWs come off the line. When I see something coming off that line, I want to look at it and I say, boy, that's it. It's ready. But see, when we look at the assembly line, what are we seeing coming off called Christians? How many people do you work with, call themselves Christian, but you could really say without a shadow of a doubt, knowing in your heart, that old boy there really reminds me of Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to remind other people about Jesus. They're looking for him up there and here. He's in you. If they can't see him in you, they'll never see him in glory. Are you okay? So let me ask you, how has all this information, all these sermons, all these lessons, all these hours of reading the Bible and meditating and buying Bibles and buying new suits, has it made you more Christ-like? If it hasn't, you need to check up and see why. Because I'm adding two and two, and I'm getting five and six, not four. Are we together tonight? Yes, sir. So there are other realms you can move, you use your faith for, other than believing God for your healing, believing God for your deliverance, and believe in God for your finances. Believe in God for a new house and a new car. Try using your faith to believe to God to prepare you for eternity. To go to heaven. Blessed be the Lord. 
those of you that have joined us in your home or wherever you might be, let me just tell you this. Well, God's not through with you. He's still working on you. And you might not be what you're supposed to be, but you're, bless God, you're not what you used to be either. God is changing your life. You've been transformed and you are being transformed. So I'd just like to encourage you, get into a good Bible-believing church, buy your Bible, forget the suit of clothes today. People don't wear suits to church today. You can forget and scratch that off, but go buy your Bible and get into the word of the Lord and find out who you're supposed to be now that you're in Christ. Can you say amen, church?